Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Julie Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. News stories are posted every month on the second Sunday at 2.30 p.m. If you enjoyed today's program, please consider liking and subscribing to our YouTube page or following our Facebook. As a reminder, some stories contain adult language and content. It is recommended you review stories before allowing younger audiences to listen. This is Black Eyed Susan by Laura Lipman. The Melville family had Preakness coming and going, as Dante's Granny M liked to say. From their row house south of Pimlico, the loose assemblage of three generations, sometimes as many as 12 people in the three-bedroom house, never fewer than eight, squeezed every coin they could from the third Saturday in May. And they were always looking for new ways revenue streams, as Dante had learned to call them in Pimlico Middle's stock picking club. Last year, for example, the Melvilles had tried a barbecue stand, selling racegoers hamburgers and hot dogs, but the city health people had shut them down before noon. So they were going to try bottled water this year, maybe some sodas, although sly-like, because they could bust you for not charging sales tax, too. They had considered salted nuts, but that was more of a Camden Yards thing. People going to the track didn't seem to want nuts as much, not even pistachios. Candy melted no matter how cool the day, and it was hard to be competitive on chips unless you went off-brand. And Baltimore was an Utz city. Parking was the big moneymaker anyway. Over the years, the Melvilles had figured they could make exactly six spaces in their front yard, plus two in the driveway. They charged $30 a spot, which was a fair price, close as they were to the entrance. And that $30 included true vigilance, as Uncle Marcus liked to say to the people who tried to negotiate. These days, most of their business was repeat customers old-timers who had figured out that the houses south of the racetrack were much closer to the entrance than the places on the other side of Northern Parkway. The first-timers, now, they were a little nervous about coming south of the track, but once they made that long, long trek back to the Northern Parkway side, they started looking south. So, eight vehicles times 30, that was $240. But they weren't done yet. All the young ones ran shopping carts, not just for the Melville's own parkers, but for the on the street ones who couldn't make it the whole way with their coolers and grocery sacks. Dante and his cousins couldn't charge as much as the North Side boys, given the shorter distance, but they made more trips. So it came out about the same. Most of the folks gave you at least $10 to haul a cooler, although there was always some woe is me, motherfucker, that's what Uncle Marcus called them, outside Granny M's hearing who tried to find a reason to short you at the gate. The money didn't end just because the race did. On the day after Preakness, the older Melvilles all signed up for cleanup duty in the infield. And there wasn't a year that went by that someone didn't find a winning ticket in the debris. Never anything huge, but often good for 20 bucks or so. People got drunk, threw the wrong tickets down. You just had to keep the sun papers in your back pocket. Familiarize yourself with the race results. This was going to be Dante's first year on cleanup, and he couldn't help hoping that he would find a winning ticket. His uncle had lied about his age to get him a spot on the crew, so he'd make the minimum wage up front. But the draw was what you might find. Not just tickets, but perfectly good cartons of soda and beer. Maybe even jewelry and wallets without ID. But Preakness itself was the best day, the biggest haul. The night before, Dante oiled his cart's wheels and polished his pitch. There was a right way to do it. Bold, but not too much so. People didn't like to feel hustled. He also pondered the downside to Preakness. No one needed the carts to carry stuff away because the coolers were always empty by the day's end. Light enough for the weakest, most sissified men to heave onto their shoulders or drag on the pavement behind them. 
which was a shame because people were looser by the end of the day, wavy with liquor and their winnings. Dante was still thinking on how to develop a service that people needed when the race was over. The main thing everyone wanted was a fast getaway, another virtue of the Melville's location, which had several ways out of the neighborhood. What would people pay to ride a helicopter, though? There had to be other possibilities. Dante thought on it. Besides, more and more people were bringing in wheeled coolers, a troubling development. Dante was a Melville, and all the Melvilles were industrious by nature. True, some had focused their energies on less legal businesses, which is why the number of the people in the household tended to fluctuate. They were at the high end right now, with Uncle Stevie home from Hagerstown and Delia's twins staying with them while Delia was spending time on the west side in that place that Granny M called thereabouts. When's our mama coming? The twins asked late at night when they were sleepy and forgetful. Where's our mama? Thereabouts, Granny M said. She'll be coming home shortly. Granny M pledged that her house was open to all her children and her children's children. And when the time came, and it was coming, her children's children's children. But she had rules. Church was optional if you were over 12. Sobriety was not. That's why she had squashed Uncle Marcus's plan to buy some cheap tall boys, layer them beneath the bottled waters and sodas, and in case some folks had second thoughts about paying track prices for beer, or decided they hadn't brought enough beer of their own. The track didn't open its doors until 9, but the Melville's Preakness Day started at 7 a.m., with Uncle Marcus and Ronnie Moe, a shirt tail relation, taking the two cars over to the Wabash Metro parking stop, then cabbing back before traffic started peaking. Weather for Preakness was seldom fine. Either it fell short of its potential and ended up rainy and cool, or it overshot spring altogether, delivering a full-blown Baltimore scorcher with air that felt like feathers. Today was a chilly one, and Dante was on a roll, ferrying coolers faster than he had ever done before, his money piling up in the Tupperware container that Granny M had marked with his name. He would have liked to keep his bills in his pocket, a fat roll to stroke from time to time, but he knew better. Even with the streets crowded as they were today, with uniformed police officers everywhere, the bigger boys, the lazy ones who didn't like to extend themselves, wouldn't hesitate to knock him down and take his money. In his head, he tried to add up what he had made so far. Granny M took a cut for the collection plate, but he'd still have enough for the new version of Grand Theft Auto. Or should he buy some new Nikes? But Granny M would buy him shoes. No matter how much she bitched and moaned and threatened to get him no brands at the outlets, beneath her complaints, she knew that shoes mattered. Even when Uncle Marcus was a kid so long ago that there weren't any Nikes, just Keds and Jack Purcells, it had been death to come to school in no brands. Fish heads, they called them then. Granny M wouldn't do that to him, as long as he passed his classes, which he had more than done. Dante not only had almost all B's going into the final grading period, his stock picking club had come in third in the state for all middle schools. And Dante deserved most of the credit for that because he had said they should buy Apple before Christmas, then drop it quick. All those people buying iPods and shit. An iPod. Now, wouldn't that be something to have? Although the Melvilles had only one computer and it was hard to get any time on it, even for homework. Plus the big kids in the neighborhood knew to look for those white wires and they would smack a man down for them, then kick him harder if it turned out to be some knockoff player. He counted up in his head again, but no, he was nowhere close. And here it was going on 3 p.m., the meaty part of the day gone. Unless he found a winning ticket at the cleanup, he wasn't going to be buying anything like that. His own CD player, though. 
that was within reach. The big race was only 90 minutes away, and the neighborhood had pretty much gone quiet when a man and a woman in a huge ass Escalade inquired about the final space at the Melvilles, which had opened up unexpectedly after some couple had a fight earlier in the afternoon. That was what Dante thought happened, had happened at least. He had escorted two people in, a man and a woman, and the woman had shown up not even an hour later, so anxious to get away that she had shot the car right over the curb, no thought to the shocks. The Melvilles were wondering what would happen at day's end when the man returned for the car that wasn't there. Maybe they could offer to take him home, undercut the local cabbies. How much to park here? asked the latecomer, the woman behind the wheel of the Escalade. Uncle Marcus hesitated. This late in the day, she might expect a discount. Before he could answer, she jumped in. Forty dollars? Sure, he said. Back it in. I admit I can't maneuver this thing into such a tight space, she said. It's new and I'm still not used to it. Would you do it for me? She hopped out and let Uncle Marcus take her place, her dude still sitting stone-faced in the passenger seat. Dante thought that was cold, making a man look weak that way, but the man in the Escalade didn't seem to notice. Uncle Marcus showed off a little, whipping the SUV back into the space and cutting it a lot closer than he should have, but he pulled it off. The woman counted two twenties into his hand, then added a 10. For the extra service, she said. Her man didn't say anything. Oh, how Dante prayed they would have a cooler. But they didn't look to be cooler people. She looked like a grandstand type, polka dotted halter dress, big hat and dark glasses, high heeled shoes in the same yellow as the background of her dress. The man had a blazer and a tie and light colored pants. Those types usually didn't have coolers. In fact, those types didn't usually park in the yards, but it was late. Maybe the lots at the track were full. Still, it never hurt to ask. You need help? I mean, you got anything you need carried in? He indicated his parking cart. It had been in the Melville family for years, taken from a giant foods that wasn't even in business anymore. What's the going rate? The woman asked, not the man. She seemed to be in charge. Depends on what needs transporting, Dante said, after seeing how things had worked out with Uncle Marcus. He wanted to see what she would offer to pay before he named a price. We have three large coolers. She opened the back of the Escalade, showed them off. They looked brand new, with the price tags still on their sides. That's a big do job, Dante said. They'll be piled so high in my car, I'll have to go real slow so they don't tumble. Twenty dollars? Twice the going rate. But before he could nod, the woman quickly added, each, I mean, per cooler. Sure. He loaded them up, one on top of the other. But, you know, I can only take you up to the gate. You gotta get them to your seats by yourselves. How are you gonna do that? We'll figure it out, she said. The man had yet to say a word. The three coolers fit into the shopping cart, just, and rose so high that Dante could not keep a quick pace. What did it matter? Sixty dollars was the equivalent of six trips. They must be rich people, the kind who brought champagne and, well, Dante wasn't clear on what else rich people ate. Steak. But you wouldn't bring steak to the Preakness. Steak sandwiches, maybe? You do this every year? The woman asked. Usually people walked ahead or behind, a little embarrassed by the transaction. But this woman kept abreast of him, her yellow high heels striking the ground with a loud clackety clack almost as loud as the wheels on the shopping cart. Yes, ma'am. You ever think about going to the race? No, I make too much money working it. He wished he could take that back. It wasn't good manners, much less good business to draw attention to how much a person was paying you. No one wanted to feel like a mark, Uncle Marcus always said. Want me to place a bet for you? She asked. She was white, white, 
Her skin so fair, it had a blue tint to it, with red hair like a blaze beneath her black straw hat. Nah, that's okay. I wouldn't know what horse to bet for. The favorite in the derby often comes through in the Preakness, and that's a safe bet. Dante liked talking to the woman, liked the way she treated him, but he couldn't think of anything to say back. He tried nodding as if he were very smart in the ways of the world, and all he did was hit a pothole, almost upset the whole load. But you probably don't like safe bets, <laughs> the woman laughed. Me either. The man who was walking behind them still hadn't said anything. I'm going to bet a long shot, a horse coming out of the twelfth gate. Know how I picked it? She didn't wait for Dante to reply. Horse bit his rider during a workout this week. Now that's my kind of horse. He finally had something to contribute. What's its name? Diablo del Val, Devil of the Valley. It's a local horse too. That's also in its favor. A local horse with a great name who bit his jockey? How can I lose? I don't know, Dante said. But based on what I see, a lot of people do. She loved that, laughing long and hard. Dante hadn't been trying to be funny, but now he wished he might do it again. I'll probably be one of them, the woman said, but you know, I don't gamble to win. The track is interactive entertainment, theater in which I hold a financial stake in the outcome. If I ever found myself too invested, I'd have to stop, don't you think? It's awful to care too much about something, anything. Dante wasn't sure he followed that, but he nodded as if he did. He was wondering if the woman was cold, her shoulders and back as bare as they were. With her yellow dress with the black dots, yellow heels, and big black hat, she looked like something. You're a black-eyed Susan, he said. She nodded, clearly pleased. That I am, but they're fake, you know. Ma'am? The black-eyed Susans. They're not in season until late August, so they buy these yellow daisies from South America and color the centers with a magic marker. <laughs> Can you imagine? How much that pay? It hadn't occurred to Dante that there was a single opportunity in Preakness that his family had missed. Coloring in flowers sounded easy, like something the twins could do. Oh, I don't know. Not enough. Nothing is ever enough, is it? Doesn't everyone want more? The question seemed like a test. Did she think him ungrateful or greedy? I'm fine, ma'am. Well, you're a rare one. They had reached the entrance to the grandstand, but to Dante's amazement, the woman didn't stop there. We're in the infield, she said. The infield? She was paying almost as much to bring her stuff as she was paying for the tickets. The infield was mud and trash. The woman would get messed up in the infield where no one would care that she had taken the time to look like a flower. Dante looked for the man, but he had disappeared. You'll just have to let this young man help me, the woman told the ticket taker, but not in a bossy way. She had the ability to say things directly without sounding mean, as if it was just logical to do what she said. Not unless he's gonna pay admission too, and he can't bring that shopping cart in. She peeled more money from her wallet. And ma'am? Yes? We need to inspect them to make sure there's no glass, nothing else that's forbidden. The Preakness ticket had a whole long list of things you couldn't bring in, and Dante stuck close to his clients in case they needed to send things back with him. Why, they're just sandwiches. The woman opened the top cooler, pulled out a paper-wrapped sub. Muffaladas. Muffies, we call them. We make them every year with that special tapenada from the Central Grocery down in New Orleans, so they're practically authentic. She unwrapped one. It was an okay sandwich, although a little strong smelling for Dante. He didn't much care for cheese. The man quickly looked inside each cooler, saw the array of wrapped subs, and waved her through. 
It took Dante and the woman three trips to carry in all the coolers. It seemed like a math problem to him. How could they protect the unattended coolers at either end? But the woman found a man at either end to keep watch. She had that way about her. They stacked each one just inside the entrance. The people around looked nasty to Dante, and he worried about leaving the woman there in her pretty dress. Diablo del Val, she said, handing him four twenties. You heard it here first. Yes, ma'am, he said, but that's extra. I'll lose more than that today. At least you'll still have the money when all is said and done. She took her hat off, fanned herself with it, and Dante realized with the start that one of the shadows on her face was still there, a purplish bruise at the temple. He pushed the empty cart back quickly, flying along, wondering if he might catch one more trip, then wondering how it mattered. Eighty dollars. Still not enough for an iPod. Not even when it was added to all he had already earned today. He wondered briefly if he had the discipline to save it all, but he knew he didn't. The woman was right. Nothing was ever enough. Back at the house, the Escalade was gone. Man came back and said he forgot something, Uncle Marcus said. Dante worried that something was wrong between the man and the woman, that he had abandoned her to the infield. He thought of her again in her yellow dress and her high heels, her big black hat and that bruise near her eye. He hoped the man was nice to her. The day after cleanup started at 9 a.m. sharp, just the sight of the garbage took Dante's breath away, not to mention the smell. There was a reason this job paid, of course, but it seemed impossible that this patch of ground would ever be clean again. A bandana around his face, Granny M's kitchen gloves shielding his hands, he picked up cans and wrappers and cigarettes, examining the tickets he found along the way comparing them to the results page in his back pocket. But he hadn't noticed the three red and white coolers stacked in the column near the gates until another worker ran toward them, said, These mine! How you figured? Uncle Marcus asked. Called them, didn't I? They're in good shape. Hell, they're so new the price tags are still on them. I can use some coolers like that. He opened the drain on the side and the water ran out. The ice long melted. If there's sodas in there, they still be cold, one woman said, hopefully. You'd share those, wouldn't you? Why not, the man said, happy with his claim. He popped the lid and started screaming. Well, not screaming, but kind of snorting and gagging like it smelled real bad. Uncle Marcus tried to hold Dante back, but he got pretty close. Overnight, the water had soaked through the paper. Paper. Yeah. Uncle Marcus tried to hold Dante back, but he got pretty close. Overnight, the water had soaked through the paper-wrapped sandwiches, loosening the packaging so the sandwiches floated free. Only, a lot of them weren't sandwiches. There were pieces of a person cut into sub-sized portions, cut so small that it was hard to see what some of them had been. Part of a forearm, he was pretty sure. A piece of leg? Well, it's definitely a dude, said one kid who got even closer than Dante did, and Dante decided to take his word for it. Police came, sealed off that part of the infield, and tried to stop the cleanup for a while, but saw how useless that would be. There weren't enough officers in all of Baltimore to sift through the debris of the infield looking for clues. Besides, it wasn't as if the crime had been committed there. The coolers were the only evidence the coolers and the things within them. Dante watched the police talking to grown-ups, the man who had claimed the coolers, folks from Pimlico, even Uncle Marcus. 
No one asked to talk to him, however. No one asked, even generally, if anyone had anything they wanted to volunteer. That didn't play in Northwest Baltimore. Later, walking home, Uncle Marcus said, Them coolers look familiar to you? Looked like every other igloo, nothing distinctive. Just that there were three, and they were brand new, like, yeah. What you thinking, Dante? He was thinking about the woman's face beneath her hat, her observation that nothing was ever enough. She had a nice car, a wallet thick with money, a man who seemed to do her bidding. She was going to bet on a horse that bit its rider, the devil of the valley. She admired its spirit, but admitted it wouldn't win in the end. Doesn't seem like any business of ours, does it? No, suppose not. The Melvilles had Preakness coming and going. You could park your car on their lawn, buy a cold drink from them, get help ferrying your supplies into the track, and know that your vehicle would be safe no matter how long you stayed. Thirty dollars bought you true vigilance, as Uncle Marcus always said. Over the years, they built up a retinue of regulars, people who came back again and again. The woman in the hat the woman with the Escalade. She wasn't one of them.